Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this MIT and MIT Sloan event. We're delighted to have you all here, thrilled with the turnout here in London. My name is Chris Schaefer. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for External Relations and International Programs at MIT Sloan. Um, I am uh, very excited to be bringing you this program tonight around the Internet of Things, something that all of us are reading about and talking about a lot. Regardless of your field of work, uh, at home, in the city, uh, are you considered smart? The Internet of Things not only has the potential to impact how we live, but also how we work. You may be thinking, what exactly is the Internet of Things? I actually wondered that myself about 12 months ago, so I Googled it and started reading up. Um, what are the implications that it's going to have on us personally and on our society? We're excited to begin this conversation with all of you tonight. I'm very pleased to introduce our featured speaker, Sanjay Sarma. Uh, he is the first dean of digital learning at MIT. He oversees MIT's open courseware and the development and use of digital technology for on-campus teaching and massive open online courses. He was one of the founders of Audio ID Center at MIT, which helped to develop the technical concepts and standards of modern RFID. Today, the suite of standards developed by the Audio ID Center are utilized by over 1,000 companies worldwide. Sanjay will open our program with an overview about the Internet of Things, and then we'll introduce a panel of experts who will give us a first-hand glimpse into the impact it will have on us. So, Sanjay, thank you so, so much, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we have an agenda, which we're going to completely ignore, right, because we're innovative, and we're going to have some fun. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in London. Uh, uh, I used to... I've sort of lived here many years ago, 20-something years ago. Um, and it's, um, I happen to be in Madrid actually talking about Internet of Things, and so this has become my IoT tour. Um, I want to give you a little bit of history um, of what this means to me, uh, how, how I feel that the uh, field came to be, the name um, was created. And also what I'll do is speak a little bit about what, it, what the opportunity is, but also what the problems are, and I think there are a lot of problems. And I've also encouraged uh, my co-panelists to drink some um, alcohol and be provocative and drop a few bombs here and there, and then we can have a discussion. Right? So that's the way we're going to run this. We're going to have a lot of fun. So the, uh, let me, as I said, give you a quick history of um, how um, my own journey in this space. In the late 90s, um, some colleagues and I, uh, David Brock, who's a professor, at, who's a, a, a research scientist at MIT, um, and I, we started wondering about this thing called RFID. I'm assuming you know RFID, radio frequency ID. If you've used one of these um, wireless keys, it's RFID. If you used a toll pass, that's RFID. And in the late 90s, RFID tags used to cost something like 10 bucks, 20 bucks. And they were a cozy little industry. And the reason they cost so much was because of standards. And that might seem ironic but because there were too many standards. Essentially what the RFID industry had done was slice the market into like 100 proprietary standards, right? And Philips had its own standard, and you know, Siemens had its standard, but they all had these cozy deals. You know, Philips had the bus service in Cologne, Germany, and was locked in, you know, so you could get these you know, passes for paying your tickets. And so we came along and we looked at RFID tags and we said, why do these things cost so much? Why are they 10 or 15 bucks? It's just a tiny little chip and an antenna. And uh, we started looking into it and we said, you know, this stuff is not rocket science. These tags should be 10 cents. And the moment I said that, there were howls of anger from the industry. I, was, I actually spoke at an industry conference and I nearly got kicked out of the conference. And, of course, being from MIT, we smelt blood, right? We thought, ah, there's something there. And so we got into it, and we evolved an architecture that worked as follows. You see, RFID tags at that time, they used to put a lot of data in these chips. You know, every time the tag got read, they would put the data on the chip, so the memory was very high. Now, what that made, did was it made the tag, the chip big, so the tag became expensive. The other thing about passive RFID tags is they scavenge their power from the, from the reader. They don't, actually, they don't have batteries, passive RFID tags. But if the chip is big and it consumes a lot of power, then the range drops because it's got to you know, get closer to the power source to pull power out of it. So it created this vicious cycle 
where the more data you put on it, the fewer the applications, the smaller the sales, the more the price had to be jacked up, right? So then they would put more functionality on the chip. And we came along and said, let's break that vicious cycle. Let's make RFID tags really, really stupid and dumb, but liberate them and make them cheap. So we started redesigning the protocols, and we made the tags extremely lightweight. We took away the memory. We said tags don't need to have a lot of memory. They don't need to play music. They don't need to make coffee. Let's whittle it down to all it needs to do, which is have a license plate in it. And that license plate we call the electronic product code, EPC. It was a riff on the, if you remember, the UPC, right? It was sexy in those days to put an E in front of things. E-tickets, email, it was an EPC, right? And then we said, and this is the interesting thing, this was in 1998, remember? We said, and then people would say, but what about the data? When a reader reads a tag, we need to put data on the tag. And we go, no, 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 you don't need to do that. And I would hold my phone up. I had a thick Motorola brick, you know, sort of a self-defense implement. And I'd hold it up and say, look, you put the data, you don't put the data on the chip, stupid. I didn't say stupid. You put a number on the chip, and the word cloud didn't exist. And we used to say, put the data up there in the sky. That was a word for cloud. Okay, we should have invented that term. And that's really what turned into the RFID suite of standards, which was connect inanimate objects with simply a license plate. Don't write to the thing, write to the cloud, and then get the data elsewhere. So we took the real world, which is inventory, and connected it to the virtual world. And today, last year, there were probably 10 billion RFID tags with our standards on them, right? So that industry's taken off. I've left MIT, done a couple of startups. Um, it's been a wonderful ride. Now, in those days, when we would point at the phone and say, one day this will be on the internet and everything will be connected to the network, people thought we were crazy, and frankly, we were, so uh, point taken. But we were trying to sort of paint a bigger vision, and it's frankly not a vision we invented. If you've seen a Jetsons cartoon, you've sort of seen the vision of everything connected to everything else, right? So we didn't really invent the vision, but we did invent the marketing slogan. So uh, there was an Englishman, Kevin Ashton, from Procter & Gamble. He and I, I was the professor, and he was the executive director of the Sente Raised Funds. He's a really brilliant marketing guy and a great visionary. So he and I were working together, and I remember sitting and talking about, you know, people are questioning why things should be connected to the Internet. And he said, hmm, let's just call it the Internet of Things. That was the first time I'd heard the term, and I thought it was terrible. I thought it was just marketing. And I'm an engineer. I don't know marketing. So I sort of ignored it, but you know, I thought it was a good marketing slogan. Of course, five years later, when everyone was talking about it, I sort of reclaimed that prodigal child, you know, sort of like Steve Jobs' father, sort of trying to claim him again afterwards. Anyway, um, so what's happened is IoT has since taken off, and, and the panelists, we were talking about it earlier, it sort of lost its meaning as well. The opportunities are incredible. They are incredible. Let me just give you one example. If you, have, if you know a 13-year-old child, your own kid, a niece, nephew, make sure you ask the parent first before you do this experiment. Ask the child if the child is between actually 8 and 12. So that's the age group. It's a, it's a thought experiment. Ask the child, honey, you see that switch on that wall, right? And the child might go, yeah. You see that light there? When I turn the switch on, the light goes, comes on, right? How does that happen? What do you think the child is going to say to you? Anyone? Guess. Put yourself in the child's mind. So, what was that? Yeah, but how did it, how did that act on this? Flies. Hmm? It flies. It flies? You're on the right track. You know what the child will say to you? Wi-Fi. Wi I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, Wi-Fi. And then this is what you do to the child. You say, <laughs> you don't know. This is how we do it. I'm an engineer. We get power. It comes into the building. We snake a wire to the switch. There, we break a circuit. And when you make the circuit, the wire goes to that light bulb. And then it goes back through the switch to the ground. Who's, who's right? You or the child? OK? We should be using Wi-Fi. For God's sake, it's ridiculous. 
that we connect up things in this way in the 21st century. It really is ridiculous. A Wi-Fi chip is a couple of bucks, but if you have to move that switch by 10 feet because the fire marshal told you to, you want to spend a thousand bucks on it with union rates, right? And then the switch could be Velcro to the wall. You want to move it? Yep, on Velcro, stick it here, right? I mean, it's unbelievable what we do. For, I mean, our, our approach to connectivity is primitive, and we are stuck in that rut. But when you can connect things up, a car, a bus, a train, a building, electronics in a building, your home, the opportunities are amazing. So I'm, I'm telling you, before I complain about it, it is the future. It is going to happen because we are super inefficient. And this is the way to gather information and make humanity safe despite itself and efficient and sustainable despite itself. It is going to happen. Now, the challenge, what are the challenges? The challenge is, I mean, I see two or three big challenges. The first thing is, we're sort of making it up as we go. You ask one vendor, and they might use Wi-Fi. Another vendor might, you know, a week later, you say, hey, I want to connect that, uh, you know, the bell to the, you know, the, the ringer to the bell. And, you know, she might use Zigbee. And third vendor comes along, and they might use BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy. So soon we'll have a patchwork of systems, right? Vendor moves off to Argentina or, you know, far away. I don't know why I picked Argentina. I just, I just went far away, right? You from Argentina? Oh, wow. nice to meet you, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> um, I sat next to a person from Argentina on the plane. That's what I thought about it, but it's far away. And now you have to maintain the system, right? They use their own sort of semantic layer on top. And you've just created a brittle system. And if you're in the IT business, you know how disastrous legacy software can be. We've just multiplied it. We've increased it by an order of magnitude. And we will have a cobweb of highly connected and integrated systems that we won't know how to maintain. So the first serious issue with the Internet of Things is there is no dominant architecture, and we're making it up as we go. If you look at other industries, you take the inter Internet, we, uh, it was not all networking. We did IP, actually MIT. David Clark was one of the guys, right? IP. It's called an R-glass architecture. We focused on IP, and around IP, we built a lot of applications and a lot of components, but we focused on IP. Another MIT thing, Tim Berners-Lee, when he was at CERN, how did he create the web? We had the internet. He said, no, it's not everything. You have HTML and HTTP, and it's a hyperlink. Right? You, click on a, some, you click on a page, you click on a link, and it goes to another page. It is actually a diminished architecture, but it created a very simple design paradigm that we could all follow. Right? Take uh, packet switching. It's an architectural decision which created a metaphor that we could all agree with. Take, forget, these are all uh, uh, networking examples. Take alternating current. Alternating current was an architectural decision, right? Before that, we had DC. Edison was pushing DC, and our tragic hero, Tesla, pushed AC with Westinghouse. And it is AC that made the modern grid possible, because you could transform up, long distance transmission, transform down, and you know, voila, you can transmit electricity for thousands of miles. We don't have that in the Internet of Things. And in the absence of that, we're making stuff up, and I fear we're going to paint ourselves into a corner. So that's my first controversial, I don't think it's controversial, but I'm trying to provoke. I happen to believe it deeply. I actually wrote an article about it in Politico last year, um, which had some very interesting consequences, I'll tell you as I summarize. The other issue is, when you don't have a dominant architecture and you make stuff up on the fly, you, let, you set yourself up for a far more disastrous consequence than mere... Uh, brittleness or unmaintainability, and that is security. It is a matter of time before, and I've seen these implementations just take off. People are implementing them all the time, and they're made up by a recent graduate engineer, and as I said, it's all sort of ad hoc. These things, it's one thing if someone can hack into your server and remove, you know, like Sony, right, steal movies. It's another thing when they can take, out, take over your factory or your car or a train. We are setting ourselves up 
for a security debacle because we're not thinking this through. And I'm frankly terrified of this. In fact, I wrote an article in Politico, as I said, and two weeks later, the, you know, why I did that thing about a car getting hacked. I know it because I, I do it. I hack cars in my group. That's one of the things we do. It was a matter of time, right? Buildings will get hacked. Factories will get hacked. And then finally we'll wake up. And this is a huge concern. Uh, I'll end here and just leave you this point. So I wrote this article on Politico. So Politico is the big US sort of AP for politics. Right? The funny thing is, for some reason, my article is on every page because it's like in the bottom that has to do with Donald Trump or the presidential elections. So if you do a search on my name, you will see Donald Trump does something wacky by Sanjay Sarma. And I show you, that's not an article I wrote. I just happened to write an article on internet security, and my name keeps showing up. So those are my two sort of uh, provocative points. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to request uh, our three panelists to come up here and maybe take a seat. And I'll ask each one of them to step up and throw a tiny little provocative grenade into the room. So the first up is, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves as well, because we want to keep it lightning and go to interactive. So first up is Jonathan Steele. Come on up, Jonathan. Andy Chu. And Dominic Gennard. Dominic, as it happens, also a former student. You see Dominic. And maybe I'll ask Dominic, why don't you kick it off? Come on up. Introduce yourself. Tell us about your company. And uh, tell us what you think of IoT. One more thing. This is a mic, apparently. But apparently, this is a Massachusetts product, by the way. So once we go into q and I'll be throwing this at you, literally. <laughs> And if someone else has a question, you throw it to that person. So there'll be some spectacle here. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominic Guinard. I'm Dominic Guinard, and uh, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Everything, a London and US-based company working on connecting all kinds of objects to the web, actually, even beyond the internet. And um, it's, it's, it's really nice to be here. Um, especially since I, I had the chance to work with Sanjay. And um, one thing that um, the company I founded wanted to focus on was really on making the Internet of Things accessible. So we work on deploying web technologies that can be used to connect all kinds of products from fast-moving consumer goods to electronic products in home automation, for instance. And you want a provocative thought, yes. right? So I think... You know, jumping on what you said, um, I, I think we're building a real mess with the Internet of Things right now, and um, all companies working in that space are responsible for that. And unfortunately, I think the consumers will have to pay for that, right? Because right now, all these devices that we can buy are actually not interoperable. They become interoperable technically, but there are companies out there that are making sure the legal framework is put in place so that one type of mobile phone cannot talk to this type of device or this type of device cannot talk to this other type of device. So I think right now, unless we break that, we're actually making a world where we build intranets of things, but not the internet of things. Talk about Nest. Give me an example. What about Nest? How does Nest fit into all this? Is it, a, is it interoperable? They have all these partnerships? Yes, I mean, Nest is interesting. I think they take, a, they take an approach that's quite interesting um, because they you know, started by establishing partnerships. They also pick an internet-based stack, an IP stack, and web protocols for application layer. So they use a WebSocket protocol, for instance, which makes it very easy to integrate um, different things with a Nest thermostat. And they're also quite open in the way they um, accept the partnerships. So there is no legal framework that prevents you from interconnecting things that technically can be interconnected. That's probably a good example, but there are bad ones also. Right, and they connect both in the, at the device level and in the cloud, right? Yeah, I mean, they started. Um, they started. At, they are now mainly um, themselves working on the device level with Nest Weave. Uh, but they also integrate uh, through other clouds, and uh, as a matter of fact, we are partners to connect different things. So we connect iHome devices with Nest devices through our cloud, for instance. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Dominic. So next up, I'd like to request Andy to come up and speak about both his views and Cisco. Thank you, Sanjay. Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Andy Chu. I'm... Uh, 
I'm here as I represent Cisco UK and Ireland, uh, and amongst a bunch of things, I'm responsible for our go-to-market strategy around IOE uh, in the UK, and I also lead our innovation activities here, where we do a lot of work, uh, a lot of collaborative research with primarily UCL here, but others uh, throughout the country, and also uh, lead our activities in incubating and working with startups in and around, particularly in and around the, the IOE space. Um, my own view on this, and, and I am um, sometimes equally frustrated about the old world models that are getting applied to how we solve some of these challenges about openness, platform approach, extensibility. My, my, own, my own belief, I have to say though, is that the potential of this is so enormous, it's so vast, Sanjay talked about uh, you know, a couple of examples just now, but if we think about the issues in developed economies like the UK around you know, aging population, right, and the amounts of money we're increasingly having to spend on healthcare and the pressures on the healthcare system, you know, the potential of this stuff to transform how we think about healthcare delivery um, and the way in which we can change uh, green, amber, and red care, right? How we encourage people who are healthy to think about developing and maintaining healthy lifestyles. How we think about amber lifestyles, right? So how do we prevent people from having to go into hospital by using the IoT to enable them to monitor, to uh, analyze, to um, ensure that they take medicines on a regular basis, you know, whatever that might be. And then finally, when they do have to go into hospital for treatment, how do we speed up and make the whole treatment and the whole process much more efficient, much more connected, and the whole thing much more holistic? You know, the potential for that kind of thing in a developed economy is enormous. And then I think if you change, if you look at the other, the other side of the world, if we look at what's going in some of the, you know, the less developed um, economies, and I was with, with a startup last week that's developing an incubator to market in, 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 in India that'll cost $3, right? Now, just the potential of that in terms of what it can change the world and how it can change is so fundamental that my optimistic, I guess, sales belief is that we will change that. And, and I think the thing that encourages me more than anything else is the fact that the old world companies that don't change it fast enough will get disrupted. In this age of digitization and digital disruption, new startups will come along that will, adhere, will, will, will just come up with new ways of thinking, new ways of operating to address some of these issues in an architectural way that you talked about. And I, th I think that, that will happen. Andy, what, what three sectors do you think uh, will take off? If you had to list out of the 50 sectors. So, so health, I've just mentioned, yep. I think is, uh, is, is an enormous one. Um, I think, um, I think smart cities, whatever that means, but I mean that from a, primarily from, a, from an infrastructure um, perspective. And then the third, I think, is energy. So energy, um, oil rigs, uh, power grids, you, anything around utilities, anything about uh, um, production of energy, distribution of energy, uh, consumption of energy, those, those as well. So that's yeah. interesting. Uh, so you're talking more about heavy industrials, and Dominic, you're talking more about customers, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of an interesting, uh, that's, and you need both, I guess, to, to really sort of, uh, for both ends, for demand management and the utility to sort of, sort of play ball with each other, you need both to take off. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the power is in connecting them, right? I mean, it's the, it's the classic, it's the economies of a network effect, right? I mean, right. I think, you know, the power increases exponentially the more people that have access to that network and can use it. And, and I think it's, it's around how do we make it easy, simple, intuitive for people to access services in ways that they've never been able to do before. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Andy. Uh, so, Jonathan. Um, your turn now to introduce yourself and say a few words about uh, what you think the issues Thank might you. be. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Steele. Um, I run a nonprofit called Deliver Change. Uh, I also run uh, the underlying technology company that does everything for it, and I also still have my consultancy. I have about, essentially about 30 years in the IT industry, everything from software engineer through systems manager. So user side, producer side, consultant, futurist, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I started a practice in my own consulting business about 10 years ago on future cities, and that's how I ended up getting into this stuff. 
So about four years ago, I set up this nonprofit. What we're doing is building the world's largest air quality network because air quality is the second largest killer of people in the UK, for example, after active smoking. And people just don't realize it as much yet. They will do eventually. Um, there's so many polemical things I could say about IoT. In fact, I just started a blog this week uh, on it, um, talking about their experience of the last three years of actually building IoT at scale. So I'll just say one or two small things. Most IoT that goes on at the moment is very small scale. It's projects, it's ideas, it's a guy in a shed with a Raspberry Pi, or whatever it happens to be. This chasm between that and actually creating a production scale IoT is huge. Uh, I would say you're exactly right about security and, issue, and, and those sorts of issues. And this is nothing new in the technology industry. I've been around it a long time, as I'm sure some of you have. How many people are in the tech industry? Just put your hands up if you don't mind. Okay. <clears throat> well, take this in the spirit in which it's meant. Um, the tech industry is a little bit like <clears throat> a seven-year-old with, with attention deficit disorder. Um, and we consistently give them guns to play with. Because I have never seen in my entire career a big system, a big company, an organization, or anything else with IT that consistently works. Everything is broken. Everything that new that comes out is broken. Microsoft's entire go-to-market is beta testing with the public. And now we're inventing driverless cars and connecting power stations to the internet. It's insane. And it will end in tears in some way. There's a lot more to say about that, but I'll leave it at that for now. Terrific. Jonathan, <clears throat> in the air quality business, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's surely that's, there are a few security issues there because you're monitoring, right? You aren't actually changing anything. There's no actuator. Uh, no, there isn't. Uh, I mean, unlike a lot of IoT applications, uh, they're actually very complex devices. Um, so we, it's what's called fog computing these days, where the cloud meets the ground. So we put, we put processing wherever it needs to be, because they're quite complicated, and they're very quite high um, bandwidth requirement between those devices and, and our cloud. The biggest security problem we've got is people spoofing data. It's unbelievable. I mean, my chief architect said, this is the thing we have to worry about. I thought he was insane. Who has the time and inclination to pretend that they're air quality sensors and try to upload the data to our platform? That is the only type of attack we've experienced so far. You know, it's fascinating. That's, that's because uh, there's a protocol in the United States. I'm going to stand up because I can't see some of you. In the United States called DSRC. Are you familiar with this? Mm -hmm. Direct short range communications between cars. And the idea is if two cars come to an intersection of you know, one car tells the other, I'm coming to the intersection, so the other one is forced to break, so they don't. But that can be easily spoofed. <laughs> and I tried to explain to the uh, US DOT that someone's going to spoof it. They go, no one's going no to have the time. And I said, my students have the time. They'll do it. So clearly, you found people who are spoofing it. Uh, and what, what are the implications? Does it sort of screw up the data? or No, to us, nothing, because that's, that we're secure. So, so we have a whole combination of handshaking and hashtagging and location awareness because all the units have GPS in them. So if it doesn't come from a serial number that we know in a location that we understand, you know, and so on and so on. So there's, there's multiple things you can do. So we actually blocked all of that stuff because we built it from the beginning because he was right. <laughs> if it had my way, we wouldn't have bothered and we'd had all sorts of rubbish coming into the system. But you know, it's a strange thing, but it's true. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to ask a couple of questions of the panel, if you, yep. if you can... Uh, uh, join the panelists. Uh, yeah. So, so we've talked about actually it's very interesting. Three very different perspectives. Um, Andy comes at it from the uh, perspective of Cisco, which is sort of a, a, a massive, dependable, reliable, innovative technology supplier. Then we have a small startup in the form of Dom's company, and that's and they're looking more at sort of consumer, the consumer end of the market. And then, uh, Jonathan, you're looking at it from a sort of a system-wide, city-wide, nationwide scale almost. Mm -hmm. Three very different perspectives. The question is, how will these three worlds talk to each other? You know, how will the factory talk to the home, and how does the homeowner talk to the, you know, to the uh, weather, so you're sort of, it's a new weather bureau you're inventing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What do you think? Well, I mean, I should say initially, um, I think it's uh, so many aspects to this. I think one of the, the things that is, that is mistakenly uh, presented about IoT is it conflates lots of different things. Yeah. Home, industrial, internet, cars, whatever, you know, everything. And actually it doesn't have to because it isn't actually relevant for 
you know, product A to necessarily talk to my network or whatever else. I think that's the first issue. The second issue is that data itself is a fungible term and, and, it, and it needs to be defined because people talk about open data. The reality is, I hate to say this, we are a member of the Open Data Institute, we strongly support open data, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is that most data, if it has value, will not be open because some, you, people will make a buck out of it. That's the nature of data. It's the nature of the industry. If you don't make a buck out of it, it's not sustainable anyway. So there is an element of that, uh, that in, in data. The second thing is about data. People talk about a tsunami of data from the Internet of Things. If you don't understand the provenance of that data and the quality and you don't curate it properly, then it doesn't mean anything anyway. So 90% of the data that the IoT is already producing is rubbish or can only be regarded as rubbish because you don't know where it came from. That's particularly true in air quality, but that's a whole other thing. Um, of the rest of it, 90% of it is going to be very specifically siloed need. The bit that's left, the 1% that's left, I agree with that, is going to be fantastically valuable to interrelate and everything else. And that's where the interrelation stands. We just don't know what it is. But we're doing the same thing as IoT. Sorry, I'll shut up in a minute. We're doing the same thing with IoT as we've done with every other disruptive technology. We are overestimating the short-term impact and hugely underestimating the long-term impact. And it's because, and I speak as a former futurist, and I still do it, actually, you just don't know. <laughs> we don't have the imagination skills to be able to understand what the future is. It will massively affect everything, we just, but we don't really know how yet. I'm sorry to play the eternal optimist again, and I, <laughs> and I, do, I do agree with, with a lot of... But, but we are living in such a different world now. Right? I mean, the, you know, the notion of dog years, you know, what used to take seven years takes one now. Right? And if you look at the startup activity that's happening just in this city, right, which I'm sure Dom sees a lot of, you know, we do a lot of work to incubate startups in this area. Um, I, I, I take part in things like the, the Duke of York runs a charity called Pitch at the Palace, which is particularly aiming at identifying really interesting and innovative startups in, in, in smart cities and, and, and IOE. Um, and, and, you know, through, through two things that I've been involved in recently, we've had over 500 startups just in and around this area developing either applications, platforms, or systems in this kind of area. And with the cost coming down now, what do they say it takes now? You know, whereas it used to take $5 million to get to a prototype stage, and it's now half a million dollars. You know, the degree to which that innovation can happen, I think, for me, whoops, for me, makes me think that I don't think this will be the same. I don't think we're going to end up in the old monolithic world that we were in previously. I think there is much more potential to, to realise some of this in the short term. I think the Gartner hype cycle will always apply to some degree, but maybe the timescales will shrink to some degree. You know, my 13-year-old uh, uh, daughter decided to build an IoT cat feeder um, and I encouraged her because she would drive us crazy when we traveled. She was concerned about the cats. So this thing's going to feed the cat and take a photograph, put it in the cloud, and then she can monitor it. So maybe she'll become a billionaire. I don't know. Hopefully she will. And the funding came from family and friends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but with the Arduino, but, the, but the, I think to your point, with the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi, uh, it's, it's so accessible now that a 13-year-old could do this. It's, it's really sort of staggering, you know. Dominic... Talk about it from the consumer world and tell us why you moved to London from, uh, from Fribourg and from uh, Zurich. Um, <clears throat> well, the London aspect, I mean, there are, there are several reasons, right? I mean, some of them are just operational. We found it, the, the company was founded both in Switzerland and in London. We found it very hard to innovate over Skype. So we really needed the physical proximity, which is a paradox in the the Internet of Things era, but um, it actually really helped. Um, and London also for us is interesting because it's the place where a lot of the brands think about their marketing, think about the, the way they will push the products um, beyond in terms of digitalization and also in terms of product concept. So it's, it's a hub where we can communicate with a lot of brands, and that's what we do. We help brands digitalizing their objects. So. What's, the, what's the craziest, wackiest idea you've seen recently? Um, Cats on the IoT? No, that'd be funny. I mean, Actually, let's, my daughter's doing that. I should take care of that. But. I can talk about one project yeah. that, that we made, uh, which I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. So for Dom Perignon, um, here in London at the Savoy Hotel, we created a button, a gigantic button that you can press 
And the only thing this button does is actually it calls, it knows where it is, so it finds out this from the cloud, calls the bar in the hotel, finds the number from our, our system, calls the bar and orders a bottle of Dom Perignon straight to your room <laughs> automatically. <laughs> You know, uh, that, that's like the Amazon, uh, that button, right? Yeah, but Amazon it existed has, before, though. But you beat, and you have location, they don't. Exactly. That's right, that's fantastic. <laughs> so, so while we uh, do this, any questions? Anyone? Yep. Not, I, I, I was hoping someone would do it, because I need to throw this at someone. That was pretty good. Very good. Yeah, so I'm interested in uh, what? A little closer. I'm interested in the issue of power. I mean, one of the issues with any sort of internet of things or everything is you need to have individual power going to every sensor or every node. So how is that actually going to be dealt with? Is there going to be some sort of wireless approach to it, or do you need to have battery power or wired power for everything? It's, it's interesting because, um, I mean, that's a huge... Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Power, yeah. OK, that, that's a huge issue, definitely, and that basically you know, we, for instance, we promote always the, the use of web protocols and internet protocols. But these, if you are really constrained on power, are not necessarily the most optimized protocols in the world, right? So when you're really constrained on power, you need to think, um, think carefully about the protocols you're using. Um, but there are a number of devices that are interesting. There's, a, for instance, a, a system called Enocean that's based just on... What's it called? Enocean. How do you spell that? E N and then ocean. Ocean oh, and ocean. And, um, they it's devices that are just harvesting energy themselves, ah, right? Yeah. So and it's just power, power scavenging. Kinetic or solar. Yeah. And then they use a special protocol to the first hop, and then they use the internet and web protocols. So it's a good. Yeah, I mean, my personal view is that power is going to be you know because to wire everything takes a lot of power. So I have two points. One is I think power is going to be a bottleneck. And scavenging, that's why RFID is useful, because it's scavenging, it's a form of scavenging. And uh, the other comment, I think, to Dominic's point is, the Internet of Things isn't going to be about big data, it's going to be lots of small data. Little bursty sort of, you know, you collect the power, and you go, boom, one chirp, and then you're out of power. So the protocols will have to be very lightweight, you know. There's something called low power Wi-Fi now. Yeah. That, um, and of course, low BLE. Any other questions? Okay, so <laughs> let's, you're going to have to throw. So back there. Yeah, you got yeah, to throw it. Thanks. I wanted to just follow on on the question of security and how did you see the security challenges? Is it a purely technological one? Um, how do you, is it one which is about market and, and spending time on it and solving it and people actually making that a priority? Um, I also see, is it one where when you see things in a data center where security issues change very quickly, uh, so hack, there's a race between hackers and, and the company that try to address those. How is that going to work in the Internet of Things where things stays for 10 years you know, in the field? I, I can start if you like. Um, Security is an interesting uh, point, uh, obviously. Um, you have to think about, you ask is it all technical, and the answer is no, it's not all technical. If you look at today's issues like take some, uh, some, some any talk, talk customers here? <laughs> great, that's great. Any Ashley Madison customers here? <laughs> <laughs> no hands. Strange. <laughs> um, if you look at the hacks that have occurred in commercial organizations, it is quite clear that some of them are idiots, but many of them are quite rational actors. They work, and banks do this as well. And I'm not talking about any bank in particular for, for the lawyers in the room. Um, they, they take a very rational decision about how much do they time and money they want to spend on security against the potential downside. And the potential downside is reputational damage and a bunch of customers losing money or whatever. Everybody knows that that doesn't last very long. So actually it's a rational decision to say, I'm not going to spend that much on security, we get hacked tough. In mobile banking, who, who here you, uh, has a, um, a phone, uh, Android phone? Please put your hands up. How many of you use mobile banking? Keep your hands up if you do. Are you insane? <laughs> Android is known to be absolutely full of holes. And the banks know it. They won't tell their customers not to use Android and pay mobile banking. Because if you lose money, if somebody hacks you and cleans out your bank account, it's not their fault. It's the app's fault, or Android's fault, not theirs. Good luck getting your money back from Android or the app. They can 
absolve themselves of any blame. It's about rational acting. That's the main point I would make. I'll leave the rest of it to the, everybody else. Um, so so in, in the, world, the world we live in today, um, uh, companies, organizations, um, have taken an approach to, from a technology point of view, so to, to your first piece, to secure things, right? So you'd secure your email server or you'd, um, you'd secure a branch. Right? And we work with customers who will, will think nothing of having 70 or 80 different security products mm. in place. We work with partners. I worked with a partner recently who we were talking with them about helping rationalize their security pro, uh, portfolio. They have 135 products on portfolio. Right? So in an, in an age where we believe, I mean, our, our, our CEO talks perhaps a bit glibly, but the point is made that there are only two types of organizations in the world, those that have been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. In, in that world where what we have today currently doesn't work, um, and is so flawed. And when we're moving, when we're in a situation where it's like one or two percent of things that could be connected to the internet are connected to the internet, then we need to fundamentally re rethink this. Um, and I mean, not to, Sanjay mentioned it earlier on, it, it has to be an architectural approach. The only way we're going to I don't think we'll ever solve it. I mean, this is, this is, we're always going to be prone either to lunatics, industrial or state scale hacking of some form. And it's, and it's, some of these guys are always going to be ahead of us. But unless we think of it from an architectural approach, from bottom to ground up, then we're never going to solve it. The notion of just trying to secure sensors at one point in the network, it's fatally flawed. Yep. I think it's like trying to uh, it's like trying to float a a, a sieve, right? A col it's a uh, sieve. There's so many holes in it. So, yeah, I think one interesting aspect is um, in terms of security is not to try to invent the wheel, and this is something that has happened a lot in the IoT. You know, many custom-made security protocols all over the place, and uh, Security by obfuscation just never works, and security by building your own secret al algorithm to secure things is also not going to work. Uh, I, I think using internet security protocols, public, public key infrastructure, you know, all, all these protocols that are already securing our internet, yes, they break. You know, SSL broke very, very badly a year ago, right? It was replaced by TLS overnight. We replaced all our servers overnight by, with TLS, right? So although using standards, um, web internet standards, is never going to make things entirely secure, it's the best way, because at least there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of traction around these standards. And the next thing is you need to make sure your things are upgradable Unlike a, you know, a fridge that isn't connected, a fridge that's connected needs to have a way to be upgraded very quickly and efficiently. Sanjay, could I just oh, add one, please, one further thought to that as well, which is, which is away from the technology completely, which is you know, in, in a lot of organizations, public or private organizations, um, security has been about risk and compliance and about avoiding doing things. And this is completely the opposite. Um, of, of, of that, and, and so the, from a, just from a mindset perspective, the, the way in which we have to change our thinking around this is, is you know, it's, it's it's fundamental. And back to the example you, you used about Jonathan, uh, Jonathan used about Talk Talk. Not to pick on them, but th it was incredible when they were declaring the issue and the attacks is how IT illiterate they were. <laughs> they weren't able to field anybody that had any kind of you know, broad understanding of, 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 of this. You, you're making a point earlier on, or someone was making a point about the value of CIOs in this, in this day and age. They weren't able to field someone that could actually talk, you know, in a kind of a, a holistic or end-to-end -end sense. And this is talk talk, this is a service provider. Yeah, I mean, I was saying, I, I, I'll own up. I said that, uh, Sorry, I, I, said, wasn't some, gonna I, I said some bad things about CIOs, okay. And then I said that the CIO of the future is going to be someone who really understands the I part, not the C part, right? So uh, I think 
uh, that lady, and then the, so why don't we toss the mic over to that lady over there? Um, so I would, I'm very interested in knowing uh, why some of the very big players, and I was studying that while I was working at the Communications Future Program with David Clark. Um, why some of the big players they have not been successful in launching um, or exploring, untapping the market for smart homes, for example? And there has been a lot of talk for the last few years on smart cities and how fixed line operators and mobile operators they would like to make off, you know, more money, get their share of the uh, lion's share of the big over-the-top pie. Why hasn't it happened yet? And why is it in silos? Is it the cost factor, or do you think there has been? Some other something, some loopholes in the technology. Um. Well, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at that. I should say that I have two friends from Ferrovial, which is a Spanish company that does a lot of services, including managing Heathrow Airport. By the way, if you have trouble at Heathrow, talk to these two gentlemen. Um, and they're doing a lot of stuff in smart cities. I think the, there are examples, but they're very sort of you don't see them. But having said that, my view is companies like Verizon, which should own yeah. computer security. I mean, uh, home security and home automation. <clears throat> they went in with a heavy approach, yep. while Nest went in with a very clean, well-designed, user-centric approach and just nailed it. It's over-ambition and under-competence. You know? It's sort of a deadly combination of big companies. And these little guys move very fast. You know? and, and many of these people aren't even technical companies. I mean, they're sort of big management you know, sort of behemoths. They can't really act in an agile way. That's my view. You know? Gentlemen? Yeah, I think the um, it, it is it's a bit of old old world economics with yeah. companies you know not seeing the necessity to do it. Um, I think the, your point's absolutely valid. Now is that the what we see with a lot of the smart cities projects is is the service providers, the, the infrastructure service providers, starting to look to see now how they can actually monetize many of the assets, lampposts, right, using those as. As, uh, as, um, as beacons or stations, if you like, to provide a range of smart city services from. Um, but, but I think it's a combination of overhype, lack of applicable use cases, um, lack of business cases, and also lack of understanding. And I think it's a co classic combination. Yeah, I'm glad you agreed with my overhyping point earlier that you disagreed with earlier. Um, <laughs> very sensitive. A few years ago, um, I'm extremely, I'm very sensitive. <laughs> Five or six years ago, when, when all the big vendors put together their big smart cities business development and sales teams, and yeah, they all went in and tried to sell on exactly the same basis they sold to everybody else. They go to a city and say, we'll do the whole thing for you, the whole stack, everything else. It'll only cost you $4 billion. So the city went and said it could find more than 15 euros down the back of the sofa, and they haven't got any money. So your point about business models is key. It is changing. If you're going to do a smart city, A, it's immensely complex because cities don't work together now anyway. So you have to fix all of that process stuff before you do any of the technology overlay. But B, you've got to find a way of paying for it. I mean, we, the, we as a sensor company, we forget you know, air quality included, but we're doing stuff now with other infrastructure and, and the people like Ferrovial and so on, um, because th there's a capability of generating new revenues. And if we could just identify what some of those were other than advertising, which is pretty much the only one that anyone anyone ever comes up with, then you make, start to make things possible, and then you, be, you may see it. But it's not going to happen quickly at all. So uh, this side has been ignored, and I want to test your arm. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul is at the far end there. Let's see. Go for it. Okay. Well, that's pretty oh. good. Oh. <laughs> well, well done. Well done. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure this is really a question as much as... Um, well, posing a thought, I suppose. Um, I'm reading here the IoT that's underneath, the Infinite Opportunities Together piece, which is kind of intriguing, yeah? Because um, this is all a little bit mind-blowing for me in, in the sense of the opportunities, yeah? So it's almost like, I don't know, 100 billion neurons meets 100 billion stars in a galaxy kind of thing in terms of, wow, it's a big number, yeah, what we can do. The opportunities for collective, connective intelligence, etc. But it's this tea thing, the together, that really gets me because I'm kind of interested in networks, nodes, etc. And we have 7 billion kind of internet of humanity, internet beings, etc., etc. How are we going to make sure that kind of we raise the bar collectively for everybody? I hear a lot of conversations, and I'm not pushing back on anything because I think it's all very important to talk about the manufacturing and all of the other sides of the technology. 
But technology is very human, and what are we aspiring to do? You, you know, when, when um, you think back to all of these things about Apollo and putting people on the moon and kind of Mars and beyond and all of this stuff, yeah? There's clearly an opportunity here, isn't there, to do something that's bigger than any of us, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I still haven't thought of a question with all of this, <laughs> but um, just very intrigued by the infinite opportunities together. In a sense, it means as much, if not more, than the Internet of Things to me, yeah? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a, sort of a pretty fundamental question. Uh, I'll take a stab at that and perhaps ask the panelists to speak about it as well. I would love to put human beings on planet Earth 100 years from now, because it doesn't look very likely right now. Mm. You know, um, I, I think that um, if you look at resources, my hotel room right now is, is staying warm, and I'm nowhere near it, yeah. right? And we'll all leave here, and this room will stay warm when there is no reason to heat it. And uh, there are cars looking for parking spots. 20 to 30 percent of all the traffic in Boston is because cars circle around looking for parking spots. Um, so I do believe that there is, you know, there are sort of, we'll start with niche cases, but I also am a big believer in the unknowable. You know, I hate quoting Don, Donald Rumsfeld, but there are known uh, unknowns or there are unknown unknowns. And I think a lot of innovation occurs in the unknown unknowns. And so I'm sort of bullish on the possibilities as long as we don't conspire to destroy ourselves before we have a shot at it. What do you think, gentlemen? And actually, what you're doing is right along those lines. Andy, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just very, very quickly. I was, um, um, my, my dad died 20 years ago, and I was talking to my daughter about this the other way that the other day. That um, if my dad came back now, in many respects, he would not recognise the world, and, and he wouldn't recognise the world primarily because what the internet's done to it. And so, if we think about, and, and I think I do think of it in terms of you know, the democratizing and liberating power of what the internet's done for, for the world. I mean, just think in education, right? I mean, you know, just think how much knowledge is at our disposal now that wasn't. Um, and, and I think we're just at the start of that journey. Um, and, and one of the things I've been encouraged about recently with the work that we've been doing with startups is just the ambition of some of these startups. It's not, you know, it's not... Martha Lane Fox talks about... You know, she's really um, scathing about, you know, much of the entrepreneurial activity that's happened in the UK recently because it's short term, make a buck, sell out, move on. And, and a lot, a lot of the, the stuff I'm seeing now is really about big, ambitious, you know, um, world changing ideas. And, and I think that's really, really encouraging. So maybe we can okay. sort of conclude on that note, and I'll ask both. Uh, Jonathan and Dominic, what's the big grand vision for all this? Jonathan hmm. or Dominic? Stop. Feel free to say yeah. there is none. That's okay. Yeah, I can go ahead and get started. <laughs> um, for me, there is one one idea that's really inspiring. It's the idea of um, the disappearing computer. There was this uh, researcher from Xerox Park called Mark Weiser who kicked off the ubiquitous computing. So the idea of computers everywhere. But what he wanted was not computers everywhere, but computers nowhere. He wanted them to disappear and to serve our needs and to help us optimize the world, you know, use our resources more efficiently, help us understand the world at any given point. And I think right now we are in a world where the IoT makes a lot of things easier, but it also means we need to still be in control, right? We need to control our rooms and so on with mobile phones and we need to interact with computers. I think the world will become very exciting once all this data goes to the web or goes to big data silos that communicate with each other and start optimizing our world for us because computers are here to serve us, not the other way around, right? That's great. I find, it, computing. I find it very difficult to be uh, inspiring and optimistic without the flip side. Please, please um, flip. I wrote a paper several years ago about, about how you could basically track the evolution of computer technology by looking at a layered model of how much in, uh, intellectual requirement there was for different layers of activity. And we started off right at the bottom, automating things like you know counting or whatever. 
And as time has gone on, of course, now we've got the debate about AI and robotics taking over and blah, 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 right? Um, Bernard Levin said 40 years ago, famously said, silicon chip will change everything except everything that's important. And to a degree, you can, if you really think about that, he's actually right, and it's still right in many ways. Because there are lots of things that it's going to take decades, if not longer, to actually do that humans can do very well. The problem is, the inspiring note is, my hope for IoT is it takes away more of the boring stuff that we should never have to worry about. <clears throat> um, fantastic. Absolutely awesome and provide lots of information. You know, hopefully it will all work out. The flip side is that there is a very large number of people who, once again, will find it very difficult to compete, to survive, to learn, to earn a living in that environment because we make more and more and more automated and more available, and it makes it harder and harder for a certain... We're almost embedding an underclass of people. How do you address that? That's a huge political problem. I don't know what the answer is, but I think that is the big, big risk of all of this stuff as we go on. And we see people talking about frippery, and we see people talking about driverless cars. Who cares? I mean, why does that matter? And actually, would you trust anybody to drive you around in Microsoft blue screen of death cars anyway? Um, I don't want to pick on Microsoft particularly. I'm sorry if there's anybody here from Microsoft. It's just a handy avatar. Um, so I think, I think there is, there's, there's inspirational opportunities, there's fantastic economic opportunities, but I think there's a massive risk that we continually, we continue to, to, to put this divide between a huge underclass and, and a more privileged and more able uh, overclass. That's, a, um, that's, I think, a very deep point. I'll just say that Eric Ben Olson and Andy McAfee have written extensively about it, um, about um, the... Uh, impact of technologies on jobs, and it is a very sobering thought. Um, we have a reception after this. I know we can get the mic to everyone, but we can continue the conversation afterwards. I just want to thank the panel again. Really an extraordinary uh, conversation. Uh, and maybe my final note, my thought on this is I, um, my personal view is I hope there's a planet that we can live in in 100 years. And we could screw it up, and we're completely capable of doing it. But I'm also a technology optimist in the sense that I'm a human pe pessimist. Right? I think that technology needs to save the day because humans ain't going to do it. So, so I'm hoping technologies like um, connected things will help us marshal our resources better. But with that, thank you very much to the panelists. And uh, Chris, are we going heading out? Yes. All right, so we have drinks outside, and thank you all very much. See you outside. Thank you. Thank you.